Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. Our presentation today is entitled, Acoustic Liquid Handling is Integral for Successful Cancer Drug Discovery. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. Since most cancer therapies currently rely on the combination of more than one drug, the need for high-throughput combination screening of drug candidates has become a critical and costly component of the drug discovery process. This combinatorial approach is designed to treat tumor cells at the primary site as well as metastatic circulating tumor cells with the hope of reducing side effects and increased rates of drug resistance. The results obtained by high-throughput screening methods are only offset by the complex set of parameters required to achieve the desired results, a scenario that has researchers demanding for highly precise automated liquid handling equipment. In recent years, this has led investigators to adopt acoustic liquid handling as the preferred method for preparing combination screening assays. Let's meet our panelists for this GEN webinar who will discuss novel methods for the discovery of therapeutic cancer compounds, as well as describe how acoustic liquid handling has accelerated their cancer drug discovery process. Our first speaker today will be Randy Dyer, Senior Product Marketing Manager at LabSite. Mr. Dyer will introduce the Technology Insight, the LabSite Echo Liquid Handlers, and showcase the latest system software application, the Echo Combination Screen. Our second presentation will be given by Bruce Posner, Director of the High Throughput Screening RNAi Screening Core Facility at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Posner will describe some of his recent work on phenotypic and targeted chemical screens for identifying novel drug combinations and therapeutic strategies for cancer research. Dr. Posner will highlight his lab's use of the lab site access platform and how it has streamlined their workflow. So before we get started, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll try and answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit Submit. So let's begin our webinar and open up the floor to our four first speaker. Randy? Thanks for the introduction, Jeff, and thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, I'm going to start off with a brief introduction of LabSite, the company, before diving into the specific products that we're going to feature in this webinar. In 2000, LabSite invented a technology that uses sound to transfer liquids. And then in 2003, they, they incorporated this into their first product, uh, the Echo Liquid Handler. Today, Echo Liquid Handlers are used globally by major pharmaceutical companies, research institutions, and smaller research laboratories. Echo liquid handlers have, have offered users a number of advantages over traditional methods in a number of areas, in, including pharmaceutical development, cancer research, and, and diagnostics. And now I'm going to talk specifically about the, the Echo liquid handlers. Um, this is LabSite's flagship product. The echo liquid handlers uh, come in different models, and, and we recommend them based on the volumes, fluid types, and, and throughputs required for a, a given application or, or set of applications. Every echo system arrives in the lab pre-programmed for a range of fluid types so that you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to go through any optimization process to transfer different fluids. Also, every system has the ability to transfer fluids from any well to any well and any any number of wells, really. Uh, this offers several benefits uh, when you're cherry picking samples, replicating samples, titrating samples in a concentration curve. Um, and it also really allows you to create complex patterns for assay development and array that can be uh, challenging to do with, with other systems. Inside the Echo Liquid Handler is LabSite's core technology, acoustic liquid handling. Echo Liquid Handlers use an acoustic transducer located under the source microplate to emit acoustic energy through the bottom of the plate up to the meniscus of the sample or reagent that you want to transfer. When, the, when this acoustic pulse hits the meniscus, a droplet of, this, uh, of the sample fluid is ejected upward into a destination well or some other surface that you want to transfer to. 
The process requires very little energy, so there's no harm to the sample being transferred. Also, a droplet can be reproduced with great repeatability by firing another pulse using the same power. And this is what gives the echo system its great precision and accuracy. Depending on the model, the droplet volume can be 2.5 or 25 nanoliters, and the rate of droplet ejection can range from 200 to 500 drops per second. So this allows you to quickly build up large volumes by firing uh, a number of droplets that are exactly the same uh, volume. Uh, using a proprietary technique called dynamic fluid analysis, echo systems can acoustically sense changes in fluid properties and adjust in milliseconds prior to transfer. This helps maintain transfer performance despite things like hydration, evaporation, or changes in the, in the fluid height or, or the shape of the meniscus itself. Um, and dynamic fluid analysis really happens automatically. You know, it's, it, as I said, it's within milliseconds during the transfer. So as you're, as you're screening through libraries and, and maybe your samples or fluids start to change, you don't have to worry about that. The, the echo is going to sense it and adjust. And remember, all this happens without any contact with the fluid. That cuts down on money spent on tips, uh, time spent repeating experiments because of pipetting errors, and it's a great boost to overall efficiency. This slide highlights several unique advantages of the echo liquid handler and acoustic liquid handling in general. It takes just a second for the echo to position its transducer under the well of a source plate uh, that you want to transfer a sample or reagent from. And, and the samples and reagents can be transferred in any order, really. Uh, again, it's that sort of any well to any well flexibility. And this allows you to assemble components of a reaction many different ways. Uh, you can do this to evaluate the impact of changing concentrations or using different components in, in a reaction. This ideal for things like assay optimization, compound screening, or combination screening, uh, pooling libraries. And without tips or tips changes, the echo transfers each sample very fast. Another key advantage of echo liquid handlers is the ability to build dose response curves using direct dilution. Unlike traditional serial dilution approaches, direct dilution eliminates any risk of sample carryover by transferring stock sample into different volumes directly into assay wells. And this creates your concentration curve without any intermediate dilutions. Since tips are not used at all, there's no risk of that, that the sample will get stuck uh, in the tips uh, or that the sample will get contaminated by leachates. Uh, and, and these things can typically throw off the rest of your curve if you're doing a serial dilution. Now, if sample gets stuck in that first transfer, and every, every transfer down um, has an error in it. And many publications have demonstrated the improved reliability and reproducibility of IC50 data produced on ECHO systems. And that continues to be a driving force of adoption for many screening groups. To complement the ECHO, we offer a suite of software applications that vary in complexity and intended use. You can choose to define every transfer graphically or from an Excel file. You can also use a wizard to set up dose response assays or create custom transfer patterns for chips and arrays. Um, we also have a software application that will help you analyze and compare samples in your library over time for things like quality control. Um, but more recently, we launched uh, Echo Combination Screen. And this is specifically to simplify the process of mapping transfers into complex uh, combination screening layouts. Uh, later, Dr. Posner is going to go into the benefits of using Echo Combination Screen for his workflows. Uh, but before that, I, I wanted to quickly run through some of the highlights of the software. With Echo Systems and Echo Combination Screen software, we, we really want to help our users overcome the common challenges of, of combination screening. Mostly, we focused on uh, combining the efficiency from the miniaturization and automation uh, that kind of comes with the Echo uh, with software that 
simplified the setup of combination screens. Um, and, and this really so that the system could be used by you know, just about anyone in the lab. Um, so we took those challenges and, and we worked with our, our uh, you know, key users and, and, and people who've worked with the Echo, especially in combination screening, for some time to put together a set of product requirements that address each of the challenges uh, mentioned in the slide before. And uh, from, that, from that top portion, uh, the, the first two bullets on this slide, um, you know, the Echo really solves that uh, immediately, right? So th this is, you know, you get, you get these benefits uh, just by moving to acoustic liquid handling. So Echo combination screen software was really focused on the lower half here, the, the second two bullets. So with that, with that com combination screen software, we ended up using a, a layering concept. Um, each concentration curve is treated as a layer with its own transfer parameters. The curves can be saved and layered onto a destination plate as needed to build the combinatorial assay. So you end up with sort of a, a library of curves that you can mix and match and, and apply as needed uh, in various protocols. Um, the final echo protocols can be simulated, and the output from the protocols can be imported directly into your analysis software. So again, we're, we're really focusing on simplifying the setup of uh, layouts for, for combination screening. Uh, we also implemented a, a direct import into gene data screener. Um, when talking to many of our users, that seemed to be a common analysis tool that was used. Uh, and we're also now part of uh, Gene Data Screener's Ready to Run program, so we're listed as a Ready to Run partner. And this slide kind of breaks down this layering concept that we used in Echo Combination Screen. Uh, to make a standard 8x4 matrix in Echo Combination Screen, you have to create one layer with a four-point curve going down a column that is repeated across eight columns. In a second layer, you create an eight-point curve and a row that repeats downward across four rows. So you end up with two layers to essentially build this uh, two-dimensional matrix. From this, the software determines all of the transfers that need to occur, the various volumes, uh, how much sample is required, you know, how much, how much of each concentration is required, and how much backfill solvent is required as well. So once you've built out your, your layout, the software then tells you how much reagent you need or, or sample and reagent you need available to run the protocol. And here's a screenshot of the primary interface where you can add the layers. And again, you can add as many layers as you need. Uh, typically it's two to three, uh, but there's really no limit there. And you can click an, uh, an edit button to go in and edit uh, any individual layer. When you do that, when you do that, um, you'll enter into a, what we call a curve editor. And this automatically determines the, the transfer requirements uh, based on kind of the common curve parameters that you'd be familiar with. Um, so you enter in your assay parameters. At the bottom of this window, it generates a table that shows you all of your uh, various transfers from various concentrations. And you can also view the resulting curve. And you can go back and actually edit that table and fine tune the curve or reorder points um, you know, as you see fit. Um, once you've created a curve, we also have a layout editor, and that's really just to control the direction and uh, direction of replicates of the curve on, on your final plate. So once you've created all of your layers, then in a pick list, you simply map your 
uh, samples in in your library plates to the layers. So there's a col there's columns for all of your sample information, um, you know the barcode of the plate that you're going to use, and then there's one column where you specifically name the layer that you're going to link that sample to. And samples can uh, be used um, in different layers. Uh, th there's no issue there. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, with with the Echo Combination Screen software, we include a direct import into Gene Data Screener. Uh, we, with with one click of a button, uh, you can produce a .cmt file that can be directly imported into Gene Data Screener for analysis. And really, with e Echo Combination Screen, uh, you you can process most of the common combination screening layouts and even some uncommon layouts as well. We, we try to work with uh, our users and, and, and beta testers to cover as many of the different types of, of strategies out there. With Echo Combination Screen and our Echo Liquid Handlers, it's all about maximizing throughput, scale, efficiency, and getting more reliable results uh, faster. With that, I'll let Jeff take over and introduce Dr. Posner, whose team has worked with us in the development of Echo Combination Screen and a lot of the early testing. Thanks, Randy. That was a great presentation to kick off our webinar. I think you showed the audience the precision of the Echo system and the versatility of the Echo Combination software. Before we move on to Bruce's presentation, I want to remind everyone once to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit Submit. All of our speakers will be available to answer your questions after the final presentation. So let's get our last presentation underway. Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to begin my talk by thanking uh, Randy Dyer and Pamela Lowe and the folks at LabSite and Jen for the invitation to speak about how we've integrated the ECHO and ACCESS platform into our research in preclinical drug discovery at UT Southwestern. So in my talk today, I've pretty much divided it into three sections. In the first section, I'd like to give you an overview of, high, of the high throughput screening core facility at UT Southwestern and how we're integrated into preclinical drug discovery. In the next section, I'd like to talk about how we've used the ECHO and the ACCESS platform in both phenotypic and targeted screening programs. And in the final segment, I'll share with you a streamlined process for drug combination screening that we developed as a collaborative effort with LabSite. But first, let me tell you a little bit about high throughput screening at UT Southwestern. The High Throughput Screening Corps at UT Southwestern was founded in 2002 by Dr. Stephen Bignight, who's the current chair of biochemistry. The goals of the Corps are fairly straightforward, to aid in the discovery and development of new small molecule therapeutics and to support the identification and characterization of novel bi biological targets and pathways. We're fortunate to have many collaborators within the biochemistry department and the cancer center here. And these are principally the medicinal chemistry and pharmacology cores, as well as nine chemistry faculty members, seven of whom are specialists in synthetic chemistry and two of whom are specialists in analytical chemistry. So when we conduct a high throughput chemical screen, there are ample resources and expertise to advance the leads that come out of those screens. At UT Southwestern's High Throughput Screening Corps, we have a number of resources and we participate in a number of activities that are related to the early stages of preclinical drug discovery. We have two principal types of libraries in the Corps, a genome-wide siRNA library collection, which reflects both human and drosophila genomes. We also have a large chemical library of 230,000 compounds. The library is composed principally of selected compounds from commercial vendors, but we also have some nice specialty collections, 
including compounds that are submitted by our chemists at UT Southwestern, as highlighted in orange, and a fairly large natural products collection submitted by a natural products chemist in the biochemistry department, Dr. John McMillan. In addition to the libraries, we participate very early on in the design of high-throughput screens and preclinical drug discovery programs. In particular, we're involved in screening strategy design in which we help formulate the initial primary assay and the succeeding assays that will be used to help the investigators find the compounds that they're truly interested in advancing. We also participate and have expertise in primary and secondary assays as well as counter screens and cell culture. We have a number of assay formats that we carry out within the core. This includes high content image-based screening as well as mass spec and light-based technologies which include fluorescence, luminescence, and absorbance. Once an assay, all the assays are in place for a high throughput screening program, we help out and in many ways lead screen execution. And this includes the primary assay, the confirmation studies that occur after the screen is completed, as well as hit annotation, hit selection, multi-dose or dose response studies. We also provide cheminformatics support, and we do all the data analysis and reporting. And finally, as compounds are identified from the screen and advanced to hit to lead studies, we are also we're an integral part of structure activity relationship support. We also maintain a laboratory information management system to facilitate data analysis and management of data. We also have computational chemists on staff to help with ligand and structure-based drug design. And we support bioassay-guided fractionation of Dr. McMillan's natural products fractions collection. And finally, we have an integral role in chemical inventory. All of these activities, of course, are important for both hit to lead optimization and lead development. As shown in this slide, you can see that we have a number of projects in a number of different therapeutic areas. Here I've highlighted uh, the major projects that we've worked on in the last two years. As you can see, we have a major interest in cancer therapeutics, as indicated by this large slice of the pie. However, we have conducted several successful projects in several other areas, and I'll describe a few of those in the next few slides. There are a number of ways to measure success in high throughput screening. I've listed a few of those here. In participation, collaboration with several principal investigators here, we've been successful in helping them obtain over 70 grants that involve high throughput screening and drug discovery. We've also been a part of over 85 publications in the form of papers and patents. And we've also helped train over 100 postdocs and graduate students. And last but not least, we've been a part of nine licenses to six biotech and biopharma companies. And these span therapeutics targeted at cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So in the next part of my talk, I'd like to tell you how we've uh, made use of the echo and the access in both phenotypic and targeted screening projects. So we use the echo access platform in a number of ways. Principally in high throughput screening, uh, we have used it for the execution of phenotypic and targeted primary screens. In a phenotypic screen, we've developed an, what we believe is a, an appropriate representation of the pathology of a particular disease. And this usually takes the form of a cell-based assay. However, we don't necessarily know what the target of our compounds will be in order to change the phenotype in the way that we want. So in this sense, we're somewhat target agnostic in a phenotypic assay. Nevertheless, we are interested in the tar target once we've identified some interesting compounds. And so in that regard, we use both genetics, molecular, molecular approaches, and biochemistry and, and proteomics to ultimately identify the target. 
in targeted assays, we're basically starting out knowing the, the identity of the target. And behind that target is a tremendous amount of validation that it involves molecular studies, biochemistry, and genetics. And so in this particular case, we know exactly the target that we want to uh, modify or modulate as a potential therapeutic approach. Once the primary screens are done, we then move on to confirmation studies. And we've used the ECHO and the ACCESS uh, in the context of both single and multi-dose studies, in each case employing replicates at each dose. Following screening, we've also engaged the ECHO and ACCESS in support of structure activity relationship studies for preclinical drug discovery. And then finally, in the last few years, we've really used the ECHO and ACCESS platform to facilitate drug combinations discovery. At UT Southwestern, there's a clear link between high-throughput screening of chemical libraries and preclinical drug discovery. That link takes place in a process called the hit-to-lead development cycle. That cycle involves plate-based pharmacology conducted within the HTS core facility as a collaborative effort with project scientists from the principal investigators lab. It also involves the use of in vitro and in vivo admin pharmacology in the context of the pharmacology core at Southwestern. And finally, it also involves the use of the medicinal chemistry core's expertise in evaluating HTS hits and in synthesizing new analogs with improved properties. I've illustrated this hit to lead process in this slide. In this example, a biochemical assay was used to screen our chemical library of 230,000 small molecules. And from this screen, confirmed hits are identified and then evaluated by medicinal chemists in the chemistry core. The chemists then resynthesize the hit that, hits that look the most promising, as well as some related analogs. And these compounds are then reevaluated in the lead biochemical assay for potency. Compounds that meet the potency criteria in this assay are then profiled in secondary assays that are used to indicate whether or not they are off-target or undesirable activities against other proteins and pathways. Compounds that meet the selectivity criteria for these secondary assays are then tested in functional cell-based assays for both on- and off-target effects. Compounds that show the requisite on-target activity in this context are then profiled in in vitro ADME assays. ADME stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And these assays are used to predict how compounds will behave in a living system, such as an animal model, or ultimately in a human patient. Compounds that meet these criteria are then tested in in vivo toxicology assays. And the compounds that survive this hurdle are ultimately tested in in vivo proof of concept assay, where pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are determined. Compounds that show in vivo efficacy in the animal model for this a particular disease then have the potential to become preclinical candidates. You'll note in the figure that the compounds that fail at any given point in the hit to lead progression cycle, as indicated by the blue arrows, pointing back to chemistry. The information gleaned from these failures was ultimately fed back into the design process for the next set of analogs, which are then progressed through the hit-to-lead development cycle all over again. And this cycle continues until viable candidates are identified. The ECHO and the ACCESS platform has played an important role in dispensing small molecules to our assay plates in both in the HTS process and in the plate-based portion of the hit-to-lead cycle, as highlighted here in red. In this slide, I'd like to share with you some su examples of success stories in both phenotypic and targeted screening at UT Southwestern. In the upper portion of the slide, I've highlighted several examples from phenotypic screening projects. In a recent project, we were able to identify subtype selective small molecules that are potential therapeutics for non-small cell lung cancer. The details of this work have been described in a recent paper that will be published later this year in the journal Nature Chemical Biology. In a second example, Dr. McKnight has spearheaded an effort to develop neuroprotective compounds to treat ALS and Alzheimer's. 
This is a preclinical drug development effort that has spanned the last five years or so. Compounds from the initial screen have been optimized using chemistry, pharmacology, and biology using the same hit-to-lead development cycle that I highlighted in the previous slide. Dr. McKnight's team is now working collaboratively with a partner in the pharmaceutical industry to further optimize these leads to candidate molecules that could enter clinical trials. A final example of phenotypic screening is Lawrence Lum's effort to identify inhibitors of the Wnt signaling pathway as a treatment for colon cancer. Lawrence has collaborated with Cho Chen, who is a synthetic organic chemist here at UT Southwestern. Together, they've been able to optimize the initial hits from the high-throughput screen to viable leads for advanced preclinical development. Importantly, in each of these projects, the principal investigators have identified the targets in these phenotypic screens using a multidiscipline approach that includes chemistry, biology, biochemistry, and proteomics. I won't be able to go into the details of these advanced studies today, but I refer you to the papers I've cited in the slide here and the subsequent papers that go into greater detail about the targets. In the targeted area, we've had considerable success as well. In this first case, we identified compounds that block the action of HIF2-alpha, that is, hypoxia, the hypoxia-inducible factor 2-alpha. HIF2-alpha is a possible therapeutic target for the treatment of kidney cancer. Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner pioneered this approach, and through a successful collaboration with the chemistry and pharmacology colleagues here at Southwestern, developed lead compounds that were ultimately licensed by Peloton Pharmaceuticals. Peloton chemists further refined these leads to clinical candidates and filed for an IND last year with the FDA. Their lead candidate molecule is currently in clinical trials. In a second example, Meg Phillips at Southwestern identified chemicals that inhibit dihydroorutate dehydrogenase, or DHODH, a key enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis in the malaria parasite. In this case, Meg ran her screen several years ago with DHODH as the target, and through the use of chemistry, biology, biochemistry, and pharmacology, her team developed a clinical candidate that successfully met the criteria for Phase I clinical trials and is now in Phase II trials where they'll be testing for extended safety and early efficacy studies. This has been a collaborative effort between Meg's team and the nonprofit organization Medicines for Malaria Venture, or MMV. In the final example, we've identified chemicals that enhance organ regeneration. And this was captured in a paper published last year. In this particular case, the target is prostaglandin dehydrogenase, or PGDH. These PGDH inhibitors have the potential to facilitate bone marrow transplant, liver regeneration following, following surgical liver resection, and may, be, may formulate as potential therapeutics for treating colitis. So as you've seen in previous slides, we rely heavily on acoustic dispense. We've been successful in using the ECHO and ACCESS platform in this context. Why has acoustic dispense been so important for us? Well, as Randy highlighted in his slides, the ECHO uses sound to consistently eject 2.5 nanoliter droplets from the surface of a sample meniscus in a source plate to the well of an inverted assay plate. Importantly, while the, source, while the assay plate is inverted, the contents are held in place by surface tension. Now, the ability to deliver 2.5 nanoliters in, user, in user-defined increments allows an experimentalist tremendous flexibility. As highlighted here, you can do dose-response curves within the same plate, with the dilutions being made on the fly from just one master well. In addition, you can also add mixtures of compounds to individual assay wells. And this particular flexibility will be an important factor in the final part of my talk today. However, a major driver for using the ECHO is accuracy and precision. And this is highlighted in this example from a structure activity relationship in which we ran dose response curves for a set of related compounds with differing potency for the target. As you can see, 
the potencies observed with tip-based delivery of each compound are more potent than those observed with the echo dispense. And this is consistent with what others have observed with tip-based drug, drug delivery. That is, there is a significant amount of carryover liquid on the outside of the tips to the assay well. Importantly, the impact of carryover is greater as the potency of the compound increases. So if we look at a compound with micromolar potency, one sees similar dose response curves in experiments with both tip-based and echo-based compound delivery. However, when you look at compounds with submicromolar potency, the, the shifts are greater since the contribution of sample carryover is more significant. So in summary, accuracy, precision, and flexibility afforded by acoustic dispense have been very powerful for us. So now I'd like to turn to the last portion of part of my talk, and tell you a little bit about the streamlined process that we've worked collaboratively with LabSite in the, in the area of combination screening. And the focus will be principally on liquid handling and compound delivery. As I've alluded to in previous slides, targeted medicines can provide two major advantages, greater therapeutic effect, or efficacy, and fewer side effects due to off-target activities. For cancer, these types of medicines are focused on attacking a key dependency of the tumor to grow and expand. However, targeted cancer drugs suffer from some disadvantages when they're used in isolation. In, a clin in the clinic, these medicines usually show a high patient, patient response rate initially. That is, the majority of the tumor is wiped out. However, some of the cancer cells manage to survive by mechanisms that are not completely understood, but may relate to tumor heterogeneity. In these cases, the target, targeted therapeutic now serves to create a selective pressure for further development of drug resistance in these cells. And this is thought to happen by two chief mechanisms, redundancy and adaptation, and an adaptive or evasive resistance. Redundancy and adaptation can occur through somatic mutations and genetic instability, epigenetic reprogramming, or remodeling of the normal stromal cells that are present in the tumor microbe environment or niche. Once these cells evolve robust alternative pathways that circumvent the drug, then aggressive tumor growth recurs and patients experience a clinical relapse. The second mechanism, adaptive or evasive resistance, has been observed mainly with angiogenesis inhibitors. These therapeutics block the tumor's ability to create new blood vessels that will supply much needed nutrients and growth factors to the tumor. To avoid starvation, some of the tumor, of the tumor cells somehow manage to metastasize and invade nearby normal tissues, and there they take advantage of the existing normal vasculature. Novel drug combinations would be helpful in targeting multiple tumor dependencies and thereby limiting the ways in which tumors adapt and thereby cause patient relapse. All the tumor, all the tumor cells in a combinational approach would effectively be wiped out due to the combination's ability to overwhelm the tumor cell's ability to survive and adapt. There are a number of approaches in plate-based screening for, for combinations drug discovery. In the literature, there are published examples that um, one can carry out combination screening in a 96, 384, or 1536 well format. However, there are some challenges, and I'll talk about those a little bit in the succeeding slides. In each of these approaches, dose regimes vary quite a bit. Uh, some investigators use one compound uh, as held constant while varying the concentration of another. Many investigators employ a full matrix in which both drugs are varied. And then finally, in an effort to save time and money, Several investigators have employed sparse matrices. 
There are a number of different analysis methods that have been used to analyze combination drug discovery experiments. And these include the LUVA dose additivity, additivity uh, method, which implies uh, or assumes the same mechanism against the same target from all drugs in the combination. The BLISS independence model, which assumes statistically different mechanisms targeting the same target. And finally, the highest single agent approach, which is independent of mechanism. There are other methods, uh, and I refer you to the references below if you're interested in exploring those as well as the original methods that were published. But today, I'm going to focus primarily on um, some of the challenges that have occurred in plate-based screening with combination drug discovery. So in this slide, I've tried to portray the anatomy of a combinations experiment. What I've shown you on the left is, this, is a sector, a 5 by 5 sector of, of a 384 well assay plate. Each of the squares in this matrix represents an assay well. So in a combination experiment, we will have the contents of our assay present, and then we will add some combination of drugs to those wells. And we'll do it in the following fashion. For the first drug that we're going to vary, we'll have a dose response that runs along the columns in this matrix, as highlighted in the blue, sorry, in the red uh, shading. For the second drug, we're going to dose across the rows, as indicated by the green shading. It's important to note that at the extreme left column, we have the single agent response of drug one, and in the last row of the matrix, we have the single agent response of drug two. So within this context, we have both the single agent controls as well as the combinations that we've generated. There are several challenges with compound handling for combinations. The first challenge involves preparation of the compound source plate. This can be done manually uh, for a high concentration of the stock for dosing. That's usually fairly straightforward. However, in, in the beginning, when we started this, we had to prepare all the combinations source plates by hand and then backfill with DMSO, the solvent that we use for our compounds, to ensure that all the, all the assay wells saw an equal concentration of DMSO. So this could be quite time consuming. The second challenge is in developing an appropriate liquid handling protocol. A liquid handling protocol is basically an instrument-specific software program that controls the liquid transfer from the source plate to the assay plate. For TIP-based instruments, the protocol drives basically a one-to-one -one lateral transfer from pre a prepared combinations plate to the assay plate. So in other words, whatever c contents are in well A1 of the source plate are transferred directly to well A1 of the assay plate. For acoustic dispense, the protocol drives an on-the-fly preparation of dosing of each combination from the master well and an intermediate compound concentration well. The third challenge is in compound addition to assay plates. And this is largely governed by the method that one uses to transfer compound. Uh, and it usually scales directly with the level of complexity of the experiment. So in other words, all the experimental parameters that you need to factor in are the number of plates, the types of combinations that you're doing, the, extensive, the extent of the matrices you're employing, and the number of repl replicates, for example. So at this, in this particular step, you need a very well-considered experimental design that incorporates the goals of your experiment, but is not overly complex. And then the last challenge is the generation of the compound mapping files. This is essentially mapping the compound source information to the instrument log files for your liquid handler. This is an essential step for quality control, data analysis, and summarization. So in the next several slides, I'd like to outline for you some of the protocols and schema that we've used to carry out combinations experiments. Here in this slide, I've outlined our original TIP-based workflow. This is before we actually acquired an ECHO and could do acoustic dispense. 
In this example, I've highlighted an experiment that we actually carried out using a 5x5 full matrix for 10 by 10 compounds dosed in two drug combinations against six cell lines. In this particular case, we had to create the combinations in a, source, a master source plate using TIP-based technologies. The combination source plate was prepared by hand. It took about eight hours to prepare this particular plate. We then uh, prepared a protocol to drive liquid transfer on the Biomech FX. That took about a half an hour. And then the compound addition itself, using the Biomech FX, transferring the combinations, drug combinations, to our assay plates took another two hours. And then finally, after the experiment was over, we generated log files, took the log files from the Biomech FX and used Excel to create the mapping files that would map back the combinations that were added. The entirety of this process took about 12 to 13 hours. The major bottleneck occurs really in this preparation of the compound source plate, which took about eight hours. There are a number of challenges with this approach. As I highlighted, the source plate preparation by hand was time consuming and error prone. In addition, there was not a lot of flexibility with respect to experimental parameters. So, for example, if we had a change in the dosing scheme or we wanted to change one of the pairs that we had dosed together, um, then we had to create an entirely new drug, drug source plate in order to accommodate those train changes. And finally, as I've highlighted before in earlier slides, we were getting less accurate dispensing from TIP-based transfers. So this prompted us to move towards uh, Acoustic, an acoustic dispense workflow. In the early days, we worked with the EDR program, the Echo Dose Response Program. And as you can see here, we dramatically reduced the amount of time needed to prepare the compound source plates by taking advantage of the Echo's ability to dose on the fly. So to prepare the compound source plates only took about a half an hour. However, when it came to preparing protocols to in the Echo Dose Response software to deliver these comp combinations to our assay plates. Protocol preparation took about three hours. Following that, compound addition took another four hours. And then finally, generating the mapping files for data analysis took another two to three. So in total, about nine and a half to ten hours, ten hours of time was required to get, walk through this entire process, equivalent to a very long full day. In this particular case, we removed the bottleneck that was associated with preparing compound source plates, and we shifted that to protocol preparation for the ECHO and compound addition. There were a number of pluses to this approach. Um, first, we no longer had to do source plate preparation by hand, so we could avoid potential for errors, and it required a lot less time. The ECHO and the EDR software gave us a tremendous amount of flexibility, and we wasted a lot less compound. And finally, we had more accurate dispensing. But there were some clear minuses. Experimental setup was time was increased. We had to develop multiple protocols to assemble the combinations curves. And we had to pay careful attention to consistent layouts between protocols. And finally, compound mapping files also took a lot of time. These had to be generated by hand, and we had to compile details from multiple protocol transfer logs. So how does EDR work with combinations? So as we highlighted earlier, the ECHO, like our TIP-based approach, doses drugs, the first drug along columns, doses the second drug along the rows of our matrix, and that ultimately gives us our combinations experiment. In the context of the programs one needs to write using EDR, required at least five programs. And this is principally to avoid the uh, duplicate matrices which would occur in the course of using the EDR program. To give you an example of this, in program one, we've dosed compound one 
against compounds 1 through 5. When we start to dose compound 2 against the other drugs, we don't necessarily want to repeat drug 1 against drug 2, since we've already done that combination before. To avoid this in EDR, we would have to write an additional program that took compound 1 out of the list of compounds to create combinations for. In addition to the multiple programs needed for the combinations, we would also have to have additional programs if we had a compound that was in a different solvent, let's say water instead of DMSO. If we were using more than one well in the master plate for a source for the combinations, that is, our experiment scaled so much that we couldn't just use a single well in the source plate to create the combination, we would have to have an additional protocol that would allow us to use another well as a source for that compound. And then finally, uh, we, if we had different dose schemes, we might need to employ different programs. So recognizing these challenges, we worked with LabSight to, to help them develop their ECHO combinations software. And here I presented the combinations workflow that came out of that effort. In this particular case, there's no difference in the time it takes to prepare the source plate in this case versus EDR. It's about half an hour. However, when we talk about protocol preparation, we've essentially done that with a single protocol in about an hour. The compound addition that follows takes about two hours. And then to generate the mapping files for data analysis takes only 15 minutes. The total time for this whole process is about four hours, which is about a half a day's work. What we've effectively done is we've reduced the time it takes to, to, to generate the protocol by about threefold, one hour versus three. We've also reduced the amount of time it takes to deliver a compound in the actual experiment by twofold. And then finally, we've dropped the time it takes to generate the mapping files by twelvefold. Huge improvement. What we've done is effectively, through the software, we may be able to shift the bottleneck from preparation of the source plate to preparation of the protocol from, to ultimately just the addition of the compound to our assay plates. And for most experimentalists, this is a really nice improvement because it means that the time you spend carrying out the experiment scales directly with the complexity and the goals of your experiment. So how does ECS streamline combinations? Instead of needing five programs, as I've highlighted here, we only need to have one program. And that program has a number of components that Randy mentioned earlier. In particular, a pick list allows you to select the drugs that you want to use in the combinations experiments and what regions of the plate that you'll use them in. Secondly, and importantly, it has a combinations filter that allows you to remove duplicate matrices. And then finally, the same program handles compounds in different solvents, using more than one well as a source well for, for a compound, and incorporating different dose schemes. So in summary, there are a number of pluses to using ECS. First of all, we realized a greater efficiency. That is, we saw a threefold drop in the time required to carry out a combinations experiment. In our example, we only needed half a day to carry out this experiment compared to almost two days. The rate limiting step in this case is just adding the compound to the assay plates, which is dictated in large part by the speed of the echo. We only needed one protocol to carry out our combinations experiment. That protocol handles different dose schemes, solvents, and matrices. And we can select the combinations we want so we save a lot on our compound or we're compound sparing. And finally, we can take the mapping files generated by ECS and use them directly in Gene Data's, Gene Data's screener module, which we use for analysis of combinations experiments. And as you saw, a 12-fold reduction in the time taking, it takes to make these compound mapping files is a pretty big improvement. And finally, and not least, we have more accurate dispensing than tip-based approaches as I've highlighted earlier. The only minus that we can think of at this point is that we're somewhat restricted to a matrix layout. And that's a current 
uh, issue that we're working with LabSite on to look at alternative dispensing approaches. So in summary, we've used the ECHO Access Platform in a number of ways that have been really important for preclinical drug discovery. I've told you a little bit about high-throughput screening and how we use that in the context of the hit-to-lead optimization cycle. And I've also described how we use the ECHO and the Access Platform in drug, to co drug combinations discovery. And I'll just say at this point that we're currently using ECS for combinations approaches in pancreatic, breast, and lung cancer. So hopefully we'll have more to say about combinations of drug discovery in the near future. I'd just like to close by acknowledging the folks in the HTS lab, as well as those who've supported us in the biochemistry department, in the administration of UT Southwestern, and in the Simons Cancer Center. I'd also like to thank the folks at LabTite for their tireless uh, devotion to making sure that our experiments are successful. And then I'd finally like to acknowledge and express our gratitude to our funding, our funding agencies, both extramural and internal. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and address your questions. That was excellent. Thanks very much, Bruce. I think our audience now has a great sense of the challenges for high-throughput screening assays during the drug discovery process and how the ecosystem has simplified your laboratory's daily workload. So before we start the Q&A session, I want to let everyone know this is your final chance to submit your questions for our speakers. We've got some really great questions already, but I'm encouraging all of you in the audience to keep them coming. All right, while everyone is submitting their final round of questions, let's begin the Q&A so we can try and get to as many questions as possible. Okay, Randy, the first question is for you. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know, what destination plate types can the echo transfer into? Randy, are you there? Maybe you're on mute? No? Maybe we lost Randy. Um, Bruce, maybe we'll... Uh, Go with a question for you, uh, uh, Bruce. Uh, one of our uh, audience members wants to know: Is there a limit to the experiment size for a single run? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, great question. Uh, yes, there is a limit um, due to the available memory constraints in the software. Uh, a single protocol using ECS can run up to seventy thousand transfers. And just to put that into perspective, most compounds have two transfers, that is a source and a backfill. And if you're doing combinations with two drugs, you'd have four transfers per well. Um, so even if all the 3D4 well uh, plate wells had a, a volume, uh, had four transfers per well, there would be, still be enough for about 45 destinations plates. All right, thank you, Bruce. And while you're on the, uh, while we have you, let's uh, hit you with another question. Um, one of our audience members wants to know what's the most complicated combination experiments you run with the ECS software. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, sure, we've uh, just recently conducted a um, fairly restricted combinations experiment where we had seven drugs in a six by six matrix. Um, with a total of 16 combinations run in triplicate against four cell lines. Um, and, and this still ran in the four-hour time frame that I highlighted in the talk. All righty, Bruce. Um, so let's see if, uh, see if we got Randy back. I don't know if we have a technical issue there. But uh, Randy, are you back on the line? Randy? No? All right, guys. Hello. Well, so, oh, I think we got Randy back. Randy, can we ask you a question? Are you back on the line now? Yes, I am. All right. So you know, we'll go back to one of our original questions. One of our audience members wants to know, uh, what destination plate types can the echo transfer into? Yeah, the, the echo can transfer into most um, SBS format plate types, so 96-wall plates, 384-wall uh, plates. 1536 well plates, um, and it can also transfer to 
arrays or chips again that that fit in that uh, SPS format as well. All right, thank you, Randy. And uh, since we have you, let's uh, let's ask you uh, another question that our audience member wants to know. Um, they ask, can the Echo systems keep track of what has been transferred into each well of a screenplate? Yes, uh, as uh, transfers occur, they are logged um, in log files. So all the information about the transfer, you know, the, the well that the transfer is coming from, the, the well or destination uh, that the transfer is going to, you know, what volume gets transferred, um, you know, information like sample name, all of that is is uh, passed through to to our log files that uh, can be viewed uh, uh, after the ECHO protocols run. All right, thank you, Randy. And Bruce, we have another question for you. Um, how do you know uh, that you're getting good mixing with the ECHO dispense? Uh, do, you do you have to do an additional mixing step with another liquid handler? Oh, thanks, Jeff. We actually get very good mixing with the Echo Dispense, and we, we don't have to use another liquid handler to help with mixing. Uh, we know this for at least two reasons. Uh, we've done dye tests where we've observed good distribution of the dye visually throughout the well after Echo Addition. And we also know that we get good accuracy and precision after liquid transfer when we look at the measured values on a plate reader. In addition, we also noted that um, in tip-based instruments, if you just simply pet, pipette DMSO into the well and don't mix uh, with the addition on a tip-based instrument, you will sometimes see toxic effects to uh, your cells on the bottom of the well. Essentially, the DMSO is very concentrated, and it just essentially, the cells can't tolerate that local concentration, and when they're hit with it, they die. Um, when we look at the uh, DMSO dispense alone on the echo with cells that are sensitive to DMSO concentrations up to, say, half a percent or a percent, we don't see any killing um, of the cells in the bottom of the well. So uh, at least if, with these two sort of lines of evidence, we, we see good mixing uh, in, the, in each experiment we conduct. All righty, Bruce, thank you very much. And with that, it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone uh, that, with, uh, that the webinar will be archived on our site at www.genengnews.com for six months. So if you miss parts of it, uh, you can watch it again or feel free to forward the link to your friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank Bruce and Randy again for their informative presentations, and I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to LabSite for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another GEN webinar in the near future. Bye for now.